Well, good morning. We've got about, I think, 18 or 20 of our folks, and most of them from this worship service. Our youth are out at at Kalahari out in Ohio uh, somewhere. And I received this text from from Shrum uh, long after I'd gone to bed, okay? Um, That's why I don't do the overnighters with the youth anymore, because, well, okay. He said, I realize that it's very late. Hopefully you won't get this till until the morning. I didn't until this morning. But I wanted to let you know while it was fresh in my mind, we had an amazing night tonight. We had an incredible move of the Spirit in our evening session. We had one person from our group who received Christ for the first time. Amen? Amen. That's awesome. Uh, Then there was a deliverance time for students with anxiety and depression, and it was amazing. There were a lot of tears, and we had a really great breakout session afterwards where everybody was sharing and listening to each person's what did God do story. It was awesome. Thank you for praying. Isn't that cool? I, I know that, uh, that many of you pray for our students all the time, and, and, and we've been praying for this weekend that God would do some great things, and, and uh, it's, just, it's just really cool, really cool to hear that, and so I wanted to share that with you. Uh, go ahead and pull out your outline, if you would. We're going to be um, uh, following along identifiers of a disciple, and uh, the reason I really want you to pull that out is the computer has been having fits off and on today, and so in case it does, then you'll... Uh, you'll have the notes that, that I'll, be, I'll be working from. Well, where did uh, 2021 go? Does anybody know? Wasn't that a wild year? You know, for some people, it was an awesome year, and they had great things happen, and there were uh, all kinds of wonderful times. For others, uh, 2021 was a year filled with challenge and, and sadness and grief. And uh, perhaps some of you, like our family, we lost some people uh, to death we were very, very close to. And, Uh, For some, 2021 was characterized by confusion. Confusion and uncertainty were the driving forces because it seemed like every time you turned around, something was changing. Just as you adjusted to one change, they, they changed something else. You know, the school was in, the school was not in. The school was virtual, it was not virtual. Vaccinate, unvaccinate, mask, unmask, and on and on and on. And so the school had to do everything differently. For some, uh, they lost their jobs. For others, they now have to do the work of 10 people. You know, they just kind of keep piling it on, and, and it just constantly was changing. And so at our jobs, our school, and yeah, at, at church, we've had to do some things differently. There have, been, there have been changes, and uncertainty and change is uncomfortable for us. Amen? It's, it's, it's hard. And for many, that's what our year was like. So today, I want to lessen the confusion. Would you like that? Uh, I'd like to share one thing that you can be absolutely certain of. Today and over the next few weeks, I'm going to remind us, I'm going to teach some of us just what we are about as a church And so no matter what else changes, you can know this is who we are, and this is what we stand for, and this is what we're going to do. So you won't have to uh, give in to any, while there's uncertainty in other areas, you can be certain this is what we are all about. Now my role as a lead pastor is to keep us focused on what Jesus has called us to do. Ephesians teaches us this. It was he, that is Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, and here it is, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. My job... My calling is to help you walk into the incredible life of discipleship that God has prepared for you. And it's to help you be ready to love each other and and to love the world. And as a church, we we function sort of like a team. If you look at, at great football teams, for example, every member of the team 
knows and understands what their role is and what their function is. The offensive linemen, they block, well, unless you're a Pittsburgh Steel, okay. <laughs> the offensive linemen block so that the running back can, can run through the line and gain yardage, or the offensive line is blocking so that the quarterback, when he, when he fades back, has time to throw the pass to a receiver who has run out this way and then juke that way, and the ball is thrown before the receiver arrives at that spot so that they can complete the pass and make yardage and move on down the field. Every part of that process needs to work. Every person has to do their role, has to function in in their capacity that they are trained to, to, um, uh, the way that they are trained to do it. All of them are important. You see, the team must have the same goal and they have to speak the same language. When players are traded from one team to another, From time to time, that happens. And and when they get to their new team, they have to learn the terminology that their new team is using. They have to talk about the terms. They have to talk about the code words and all of that so that they can understand what the goal, have a common understanding of what they are trying to accomplish. And then everybody has to work together to achieve those goals. So for a football team, the goal is to win the game. Here's a question. As a church, what is a win? What is a win for us? How do we know when we have been successful? You see, it's vitally important that you and I all understand what the win is, what the goal is, what we want to accomplish. Because you see, if we are working for different goals, if we are striving in different directions, we all could expend a tremendous amount of energy and never arrive at a win. Before I became your lead pastor, the church had decided what a win was going to be. And since I've been your pastor, I've just tried to keep us focused on what this is. And a win for us as La Trobe UM Ministries is this. It's our vision. Read it with me. The vision of LUMC Ministries is to make, mature, mobilize, and multiply disciples of Jesus Christ in the community and beyond. And so our mission then is how do we accomplish that? Everything we do tries to point back to that, and the mission is about the methods that we use to try to achieve that, and the mission of the LEMC Ministries is to develop biblical disciples through intentional relationships. That's an overarching mission of how how we accomplish that. Now, stay with me. If, as a team, our goal Our definition of winning revolves around disciples. What's a disciple? If that's the focus of what we are about, it's imperative that you and I, that all of us are working from a common definition and a common understanding of what a disciple is. What are the identifying characteristics of a disciple? How would you identify one? How would you know? How would you know when someone has been made a disciple, has been matured, mobilized, and multiplied? How do we know? You see, if, if we have a wrong or an unclear goal, the road to success and the road to failure are the same role. So we need to be certain what we are about. When we know what we are about, what we are focusing on, that gives us as a church family parameters around what we will do and what we won't do. There are a lot of wonderful things that many other churches do that we as a fellowship will not because it doesn't fit our win. You follow me? And so you and I, it it helps to provide for us some guardrails to keep us on track towards where we believe God has called us to be. So to help guide us in that, to help us accomplish that, I want to introduce to you this morning our verse for the year and our word for the year. Our verse for the year is in Matthew 4.19. And we're going to be coming back to this verse and to this word over and over again this year. So, so you can begin memorizing it right now. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 19, Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. That's our theme verse for the year. And our, and our word for the year is follow. 
Now, from that verse, we get the common definition of a disciple. This will be our common language. It'll be our common focus. It'll be our common vision for all of us. A disciple is one who is following Jesus, who is being changed by Jesus or being transformed, and who is serving with Jesus or helping in the ministry of Jesus. All three of those things is what it means to be a disciple. In other words, as a follower, we're not just saved. Our faith is not just fire insurance. Our, our faith involves following and, and walking Jesus. You see, Jesus does not exist to make you happy. Jesus doesn't exist so that you can have a wonderful life. You see, we have made it, uh, sometimes we make this whole thing of following Jesus, we make ourselves the center. Oh, happiness and a wonderful life. Sometimes those are byproducts, but the goal, the focus, the center is Jesus. It's not us. It's him. It's Jesus' agenda, not mine. And so first and foremost, the disciple is one who is following. Jesus is the engine that's moving this train. And it's not about us. Jesus was calling to his first disciples and, and he called upon them to leave their, their, the fish that they were catching and follow him. And it was like, all these fish, you want us to leave this? And Jesus said, yes. And they did. So first, a disciple is one who is following. Second, a disciple is one who's being changed by Jesus. You see, they have, Jesus called those disciples to be part of what he was doing. And so often we talk about the priesthood of all believers, but we don't believe it. See, being a disciple is not just bringing other people to church so they can hear a word from me. Being a disciple means inviting people into the same relationship that you have with Jesus. The most important thing, the thing that brings more people to faith than preachers are changed lives. When people around you, they know who you are. And they see how you live, and all of a sudden they say, you know, she doesn't have the temper that she used to have. Or, you know, he is so much more patient than he used to be. Or, you know, they used to be so upset over this stuff, and now they're, they're so much calmer. Then they say, okay, what's the difference? And then we can share the difference that Jesus has made. You see, Jesus is shaping and forming his disciples. Being a Christian is not something we do just one time and then we are done. Day by day, it's God's intention for all of us to progress in maturity. Whether we've been following him for one day, one week, or 80 years, God still wants us to be changed, to be transformed, to grow. And then he invites us to serve with him, where we are committed to the vision, to the ministry that Jesus has. You see, we are sent. A disciple is someone who is doing all three of those things, who is saved, who is changing, and who is serving. You see, that's why we talk about making, maturing, mobilizing and multiplying disciples it's the same thing now some things that you have to understand about discipleship is first of all it it is a journey it's not a destination we don't arrive as long as we're living there's still stuff that jesus needs to do in in our lives in the same way that sin often enters our lives slowly almost imperceptibly so it is with our growth of discipleship Many times people will will turn around and look at their lives and they won't realize how far they've strayed away from Jesus and that's because because it happens slowly over time. In the same way, our spiritual growth, sometimes you can have devotions for months and months and months and it's taking you just a little bit, just the next step in that whole process where you keep doing the right thing. You keep doing the right thing because it's the right thing. I have a friend that has some bamboo in his backyard. Any, anybody here have bamboo in your backyard? It was taken over the place, all right? And he's told me a story of bamboo. He planted that, and, and for seven years, nothing happened. For seven years, it stayed exactly the same size. And so I started to do some reading, and, and what I found is if you plant bamboo, and I, I don't know how to do that, but, but they say you plant it, it seems like nothing is happening, and then all of a sudden it'll start growing. 
and it would grow sometimes up to a foot overnight. How about ladies that become pregnant? You know, the baby grows for a long time before anybody knows anything's going on, right? Because that growth is unseen. It's often not that the outside world can see or, or, or can know. And then the baby grows and it, and, it, and it continues to grow. And then when the baby, they go to the hospital, the baby's born in the hospital. And, and not surprisingly, there are lots of things that happen at that time. The hospital has procedures and systems and processes that are already in place because they are expecting babies to come, Right? And when the baby comes and the baby is born, all of those things are in place and all of those people, they know their individual jobs and their roles to play so that the baby, as it comes into its physical life, can have a life of health and maturity and can grow. Amen? Everybody fits in their spot. And we even have special doctors and pediatricians and all sorts of people whose mission in life is to help babies and kids grow into adults. Shouldn't the church do the same thing with spiritual babies? Listen to this. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now, this guy, Nicodemus, he was a religious guy, and he should have understood all this stuff, but he didn't. And he came to Jesus under the cover of darkness. And Jesus said the transformation that happens to a person who turns their life over to Jesus is so radical that the only way to describe it is as if they were born again, born for a second time. So when someone is born the first time, we go to great and immediate lengths to make sure that they are put on a pathway to health and development. But the vast majority of time in the church, when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ and they are born again, sometimes we hand them a book and we shake their hand and we say, good luck. Shouldn't we as a church be about developing the systems and the processes that will help people as they come to faith in Christ, that will provide the environments where they can take their next steps of their spiritual journey? That's what our vision is. That's what we are developing. That's what we are growing. Sadly, so often we expect them to make it on their own. We expect them to make friends all on their own. Folks, you and I have to take it personally. When somebody comes into these worship services that you don't know, I never want you to think, you know, somebody should say hello to them. Guess who that somebody is? It's you. You see, it's all of our responsibility. We are all on the team. And every piece and every part has to be working and functioning in order for spiritual babies to grow. You see, very often when our children and grandchildren are born, we dote over them. We do everything for them. We strive to serve them, to keep them safe, to help them grow. Shouldn't we do the same for spiritual babies? Shouldn't we do the same? Focus on helping them. But the sad thing is, so often, we expect spiritual babies to act like spiritual adults. And they won't. Sometimes I see Christians who are out at Giant Eagle or, or in the mall or something, and, 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 and non-Christians are, are, are spouting off, and they're saying this and saying that, and the Christians look like they're so offended. And I, want, and I want to say, why are you surprised when the world acts like the world? That's who it is. That's who we're called to help work with Jesus and love them, not judge them. Love them in the process of growing, not expecting them to grow on their own, but serving them, protecting them, and helping them grow. The reason this doesn't happen is that many people have come to faith, but they've never been discipled. I would suspect there are people in this room right now that you've been a follower of Jesus for years, but you've never been discipled. 
You've never been challenged or never been part of a system that would help you take the next step of your spiritual journey. There are so many people who have been converted but never discipled. They've been born but never grown. And spiritual infancy abounds regardless of whether that person has been following Jesus for one day, one week, 10 years, or or 50 years. You see, I don't care where you are in your spiritual journey. God has a next step for you. God has more that he wants to do in your life. And we collectively together as a church, it is our job to encourage and to challenge and to provide the environments where people can face the truth about themselves and the truth about God and take their next step of discipleship. You see, every disciple is called to reproduce other disciples. But sadly, there's been an attitude that's come about in our churches where they look at the pastors and they say, well, we're paying you to do that. Folks, if if our staff of our church are the only ones who are making disciples, Christianity will die. There's just not enough of us. There's not enough to go around to a world that is sinking fast. You are needed. Now, there's some myths about uh, about about what means to be a disciple, and one of the reasons why people um, uh, why people don't disciple other people is because they're afraid and they don't understand how discipleship works. Sometimes we think to disciple someone that we have to have our act all together. I had my act all together one time and I lost it. <laughs> I forgot where I put it. You see, we are all messed up. Amen. We're messed up at different ways at different times, and every one of us is just trying to find our way through to take our next step of of our spiritual journey. So if you expect to be perfect, you'll never disciple anyone. And if you're expecting to follow someone who is following Jesus, if you expect them to be perfect, it won't happen. All discipleship is is someone saying, okay, I'm, I'm six inches ahead of you, and I invite you to walk with me. Let me walk with you. And help you take your next step. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the reality of the Holy Spirit doing that work. In verse 16, it says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now what that means is then we begin to see Christ more clearly. As we begin our walk of discipleship, we see things spiritually that we never saw before. And that is a gradual thing where our sight gradually becomes better and better. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I love how the... the, uh, The Living Bible says this, says, And as the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him. Now, I want you to understand how discipleship works. First of all, discipleship is a process of growth. It's not just snap your fingers and it happens. There's a progression, a growth into maturity. That's God's preferred pathway of every disciple. Now, you're familiar with a process like this. You don't realize it. But how many of you have gone to school? We don't expect the second grader to do calculus, do we? You begin and you develop the process and and provide the environments to help them grow and understand increasing mathematics. It's the same thing in the spiritual realm. It's the same process where we learn to take those steps. You see, spiritual growth is not just for a few It's God's plan for everybody. When a a physical child fails to grow and fails to mature and fails to thrive, we realize something is wrong. We have to start to recognize it in the body of Christ. If you have someone who's been a follower of Jesus and they're not maturing, they have not grown for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, something is wrong. And we have to help them take those next steps. It is a lifelong journey that we have to persevere constantly for. It is our moving towards Christ-likeness where where we are more and more shaped and conformed into his image. You see, the Holy Spirit does the changing. We do the cooperating. God's job is to change us. Our part is to let him. 
You see, maturity is where we bring our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, and our attitudes in line with those of Jesus. And it's not merely intellectual. Sometimes people think if I just studied the Bible more, if I would just have more knowledge. The Bible says knowledge puffs up. It be growing spiritually is more than knowledge. Yes, it's important to have that knowledge, but it's more than that. Becoming like Christ requires obedience. The road, the key to discipleship is obedience. Discipleship involves obedience. I sometimes have met Christians who have been just kind of stuck and they said they're not growing. They, they just kind of feel like it's the same old, same old. They're not learning anything more about Christ. And as I talk to them, you begin to peel back the layers. More than once I have found out that, that it was a time when, when God told them something and they basically said no. Like in their walk of spiritual maturity, God said, you know, you really need to forgive her for what she did. And they said, nope, not doing that, God. Or the Lord said, you know, you, you need to really build that relationship back with him. Nope, I'm not going there, God. Or God said, you know, I want you to do this for me. And they say, no. You see, God won't reveal more about himself until you're willing to walk in obedience to what he has already shared with you. It's progressive. It's one step after another when Jesus said, follow me. And discipleship is not a linear process. Sometimes we think that growing is just going to be up and to the right. You know, everything's good, better, best. No. I don't know how your walk of discipleship has been, but you know what mine looks like? <laughs> up and down, up and down, sometimes three steps forward, 2.9 steps backwards. And you see, it's, it's not a linear process. And, and discipleship is different for every follower. You see, no two relationships are the same. I have a brother and a sister, and there's three siblings, and every one of us love our father dearly. But every one of us express our love for our earthly father very differently. Any siblings here understand that? Because we're different people. And so the way we learn to express our love to our heavenly father sometimes will be different as well. One of the things on my bucket list is to go to Australia. Anybody want to go with me? I, I, I just want to go there. The outback, you know, and, and just all, all of those things. Crocodile Dundee, that's not true, okay? But, but, but I just would love to do that. And, and, and some years ago, I was doing some reading about Australia, and a lot of areas of the desert, they would raise sheep and other, uh, you know, and, and other animals, and they did it without fences, and I wondered, how do they keep their animals around if they don't have fences to keep them in? You know what they do? They dig a well. They dig a well. And where there's water in the desert, the sheep stay. And so you and I need to be constantly staying close to the water of the Holy Spirit as our life source, and that is Jesus. And we walk together. Next, discipleship is empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, it really is a supernatural activity building us into the image of Christ. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now here's your discipleship. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Our walk of discipleship begins and continues with a decision where we decide and we say, Jesus, I'm going to take this step. Jesus, with your Holy Spirit helping me, I will take this step. And what we do every year, the first or second Sunday of the year, is we share Wesley's Covenant Prayer, which is just a way of you and me, of, of a way for us to commit to that decision to walk the walk of discipleship. It's on the back of your bulletin, Wesley's Covenant Prayer. And as we conclude our time, let's pray this together. Pray it with me, please. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Let's stand as we worship.